and gentlemen, what's going on? And welcome to another great episode of The Stoop, where we talk hoops, hoops, and more hoops. I'm your host, TJ. Thank you guys for tuning in for another great, great episode. Before I get into it, I got to introduce my player partner, my co-host and co-founder, my guy, Kev P. Kev P, say what's up to the people, bro. Man, you already know it's a pleasure to be here, fam. Hey, Kev, listen, this one right here is very, very special, man. On the show tonight, we got a Henstead, New York native. And when we talking about one of the fastest in the league to ever do it, it's our special guest going on. He's a league vet. He's also an NBA champion, where people have almost forgot. He's a two-time American East Player of the Year. And now he's on the sideline coaching back at the alma mater. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to have him on the stoop tonight, Mr. Speedy Claxton. Mr. Speedy Claxton, thank you so much. What's up, what's up, what's up, y'all? Thanks for having me on, man. Looking forward to this. Appreciate you, appreciate you. So let's go ahead and get into it. When were you first exposed to the game of basketball? Uh, probably when I was just probably like in the second or third grade. Uh, I used to actually go to my sister. I used to go with my sister to her cheerleading practice. And then there was a group of young boys practicing on the other end. And then I used to, I, I just asked her, I was like, yo, can I go play with them? And then ever since then, I, I fell in love with the game. Okay, okay. So let me ask you this question. At what age did you think you could actually do something with the game for the future? I'll, I'll probably say when I was about 16, honestly. That's when I started to come to my own. I started to take it more serious. And I was looking at my peers, and I was so much better than them. So I was like, you know what? I might be able to make some money playing this game. Okay. Okay. Being somebody who's taking the, the, the love of the game to the next uh, next level, next level, and to the ultimate level of the league, which you've done, um, you spent a lot of times, countless hours, determination, being in the gym when nobody's watching. What was that one thing in the gym that you spent a lot of time on working on to be better in your game? Well, for me, it was my jump shot. Okay. Um, you know, I was I was very fast. I was able to get by my def- my defender, and I was able to get to the basket at will. But as I got older, you know, I was playing, I started playing against more size and length and it was harder for me to get my shot off. And then, you know, once I started playing college basketball and then teams had defensive schemes and they was actually like trying to stop you and not trying to have you use your strengths. And then, you know, people started just laying off me, daring me to shoot the basketball. So then I had to really focus, get into the gym and, and work on getting my jump shot right. And once I got that right, my senior year, um, I saw my I still I saw my scoring increase drastically. I went from averaging 16 points to averaging 23 points and almost leading the country in scoring just just by adding a jump shot. Got you, got you. Go ahead, Kev. Listen, man, I grew up in Brooklyn. We the same age. And uh, you played for storied Christ the King, and y'all used to come yes, sir. and ravage my high school. Um, <laughs> wasn't even fair. You rolled through with cats like Eric Barkley, Lamar Odom. Yeah, those are my guys. Yeah, yeah, y'all, y'all, y'all did us dirty. I don't even want to talk about it. It hurts. <laughs> <laughs> but with that being said, what are some of your fondest memories playing with those guys before heading off to Hofstra? It definitely winning the city championship my junior year. Their sophomore year, um, we we had an amazing team, man. Our bond was so strong. You know, we was together like all the time. Uh, we was at each other's houses. I mean, we we did everything together, and I think it definitely helped our chemistry on the court. But those are my guys for life. We're actually in the process of trying to do a documentary on that team. Yeah, sure, which will be dope. So definitely winning the city championship my junior year, that sophomore year, um, and then trying to repeat. My senior year, that junior year, I mean, that whole year was magical. We was ranked number two in the country. Unfortunately, we lost in the city championships that year to Rice High School, which was, was which had a really good team also. I mean, we didn't lose Absolutely. any bombs. Absolutely. Listen, I wanna, I wanna address something real quick. You are one of those players that go along the lines of Muggsy Bogues, Doc Rivers, whose nickname is synonymous with who they are. So much so that if I say Craig Claxton, people look at me like, who is he talking about? (laughs) So no one knows you by that name. Who gave you that nickname? Who coined Speedy? And when did you become known as that? Like, that's that's the name. Uh, Artie Cox gave it to me. One of my former AU coaches, even though when he gave me the nickname, he wasn't my coach. He was actually an opposing coach 
that I used to play against all the time when I was in like the seventh, eighth grade. And they didn't know my name. You know, it wasn't no scout reports back then or anything. So they just they just referred to me as the Speedy Kid. And then I actually <laughs> went seriously. And then I actually went to uh, Crazy King's basketball camp, and a lot of his players was there also. And, you know, they just started calling me Speedy because that's what they knew me as. And then next, you know, the whole camp started calling me Speedy, and it just stuck. All right. Okay. Now, in the 2001-2002 season, um, the Sixers are coming off of a, a championship run. Um, unfortunately, because of your rookie year, you were injured a little bit. But by that, that, that real first year for you, which is your second year on the team, you got some good minutes. Like, you're averaging, like, 23 minutes a game in yeah. between 8 to 10 points a night. But let's really get into it. What was those practices like between <laughs> you, AI, E. Snow, and Aaron McKee, man, you the youngster on the scene, and, and, and you cooking. What's up? Nah, we went at it. Um, it used to be me and my man Aaron McKee against E. Snow and AI every day. And we used to go at their heads. Like, <laughs> we, we, we gave it to them. They, they ain't no lie. Like, I would go at AI and Blue would go at E. Snow, and we would go at it. Seriously. We, we definitely had some wars. Now, I don't know if this is true, but I heard, because I'm a Temple alum, and I know... Everybody used to come up to the yard back in those days. Oh yeah, there was a, there was a rumor that you and AI had a foot race. Either was in a practice or after practice. Is that a true story? And what went down? <laughs> no, nah, that's not a true story. Okay. <laughs> Him and I never raced. Okay, but <laughs> in your mind, in your mind's eye, who was faster, you or him? I think I'm faster. Okay, I think I'm faster. Okay, let me move on to another question. Let's talk culture because you've been a part of. Um, a legendary franchise in the Spurs who has a championship pedigree and also the Warriors who's now developed a championship pedigree. Everything comes down to culture from the front office uh, down to the players on the floor. Um, how do you think that sets the tone for people to win on that level and also seeing how players are now choosing their own destinies and paths because they don't like the way front offices are moving. How do you feel that hurts the, the, the league or does it hurt the fan more so? Yeah, it's, it's wild the way these kids are moving now where <clears throat> they're they're able to request a trade and not just request a trade, but request who they want to play. Who they, yeah, the destination yes. also. It's like, yo, now if that was my <laughs> if that was my team in my organization. Okay, you want to get traded? Okay, but I'm gonna send you where I want to send you. Who's gonna give me the most back for you? Right. I'm not sending you where you want to go. I'm not trying to look out for you, no right. matter what. No matter what you did for the organization. But the culture of organizations are definitely important. Uh, when I played with San Antonio, I mean, the, the, the culture was amazing. Like, that was that was probably my best stop uh, out of all my stops when I, in the NBA. Um, you know, I, played for, I, played, I played for some bad organizations, too. Like, when I played for the Warriors, it wasn't a great organization at the time. Right. Now they, now they have new ownership. <clears throat> they established a winning culture. But it wasn't like that when I first got there. Gotcha. Like, the fan base was great. You know, they came up. They came out and showed out every game and cheered, even though we was losing. So I'm, I'm definitely happy for the city because they they definitely deserve it. So during your championship run back in 03 with the Spurs, man, give me a memorable time that you had, a you know, a memorable game with you. And what's it like playing for the organization that's so valued and near and dear? Because in San Antonio, y'all are the only sports franchise in the city, so there's a lot of love. I just remember game six and being on the court those last couple of seconds and realizing that, we're about to win an uh, NBA championship. Like, it was, like, mind-blowing. Like, you know, growing up as a kid, watching it all those years, watching Michael and Magic and Isaiah, you know, Kobe, Shaq, and all those guys. And actually, like, being in myself and not just being on the team, but being on the actual court, like, making shots was <laughs> – I'm talking about, like, it's, it was crazy. Like, it was, it's, only, it's only now, after the fact, that I, I'm watching the championship games now and I think back, like, wow, that's crazy. Like, I was really, that was really me, like, playing in the finals. Like, it's, it's, it's wild. Definitely. Go ahead, Definitely. Appreciate that. So, so we talk about you playing as a, as a player and, and, and what it meant to be as a part of that championship. But then later on, you had a successful stint as a scout for the Warriors. Um, yeah. You signed on with your alma mater, Hofstra, as a special assistant coach. And in October 2020, last year, 
you were named top mid-major assistant coach by the majority, uh, by, I'm sorry, by the minority, minority. coaches association. Congrats on that, by the way. Um, Thank you. Appreciate it. That, that meant a lot. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. Sky's the limit. What did that mean to you? And ultimately, what's your goal moving forward? <clears throat> It meant a lot to me because I'm not one of those. I'm not one of these guys that self promote a lot. So to to have my talent recognized by people that I didn't not I didn't know means means a lot because that that means I'm truly I'm truly deserving of it, honestly. Definitely. And what, what's the, what's the next goal moving forward? Are you looking to do head coaching somewhere? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the goal. I want to be an assistant for the rest of my life. I, I definitely want to take the reins of a program and see what I could do with it. Yeah. All right. What have you seen Kobe's- real quick? Hold on real quick. What have you seen from college kids from your day till now, man? And what 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 what, what do you hope that they gain as, as the opportunity being a collegiate star, being a collegiate player, man? That's different from back in the day. Uh, it's just overall wisdom, man. Learning to get a better feel and knowledge for the game. You know, me being a college coach, I'm around a lot of college kids. I see a lot of college basketball being played, and I think the IQ is lacking, man. It, it really is. Like, we got to start teaching these kids um, from the grassroots and getting them familiar with the game and learning the game and not just playing the play, like actually having a purpose out there. Mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kev. Uh, I I just wanted to touch on something. I know real quick that um, Kobe's untimely demise kicked off what would be like a wild 2020 for everybody. Um, and the term girl dad went viral. Yeah. You have three beautiful young daughters at home. I do. How much tighter are you hugging them these days in light of Kobe's passing, as well as other social developments that have happened in the last year or so? You know, my relationship with those three got even closer. Not that it wasn't close, but, you know, life, I think a lot of people take life for granted. Um, and we're not going to, tomorrow's not promised. So you got to love on your loved ones and tell them you love them every day because you never know when it's going to be the last day you get to see them. So I'm definitely a girl that I love my girls. And I actually just, I actually just sent that message to my oldest daughter today and let her know how much I love her and that we can't take this life for granted. That's what's up. Are any of them um, interested in, in sports or any activities of the sort? My two younger ones um, were into sports. My middle child was a great, she was really good gymnast when she was younger, but now she's a girly girl, so she's, she's getting out of it. Uh, but my youngest one, she's still into gymnastics, and hopefully that's the one that's, that's going to be an athlete for me. Okay. Yeah, T. Definitely. So we're going to continue real quick in, in, in honor of the great uh, Kobe Bean Bryant. Is there something as a, as a memory when you played against him that sticks out? And is he everything that everybody talked about being, you know, a <clears throat> consummate dude that just went at you? We've had other guests on the show and they was like, man, Kobe is everything you you, you wanted and some. Yeah, Kobe is a great dude, man, on and off the court. I mean, he he's a great work. He's a great player, but you know why, because he, he was probably the hardest worker. Um, I never got a chance to, to play with him, but uh, a good friend of mine, my boy Lamar Odom, uh, played with him for a number of years, and he used to just tell me stories of how hard uh, a worker Kobe is. And he was already at that stature, but he's still be in the gym going at it like crazy. I'm like, wow, that's, that's dope. Amazing. Shout out to LO. So out of you, Mike and Lisa, I want to know, man, who is the most competitive in the family? And then I also want to ask you, nowadays we see families are, are, are being a big thing in league sports. And we look at the ball family. How much is enough when you see parents getting involved in sports? Um, is there a fine line between the media and being in the bleachers and when parents should just be quiet and let their kids play? <laughs> we, well, my family is very, very competitive. I mean, we all like to win right. at all costs. I mean, no one likes <laughs> no one likes to be a loser. Whereas I think this generation now, losing is accepted, which is wild to me. Like, nah, that was that's that wasn't even a, a choice back then. Um, but you know, the, these kids are different now, man. They just they just are. That's because um, you're still getting trophies parents, even when you lose. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 the start of it. Everybody get a participate participation trophy. So it's like, 
nah, you don't get a trophy unless you win. Loser don't get anything yes. back in the days. Like, nah, yeah. you gotta you gotta earn it. You got to earn everything you get. Now it's just given to you. Like, you know what I'm saying? So these kids are spoiled. But I mean, it's the parents. Everybody, the parents go so hard because I think the setup is different now. So if you have a young phenom um, nowadays, it's easier to, for you to see. You, it's easier for you to see the path to the NBA. You know, with the you know with these kids playing like the EYBL. EYBL is the the the, the highest ranking AAU tournament. So like the best of the best players in the country play there. So you pretty much know if you're one of the top kids there in the EYBL in your class, you you have a high chance of getting to the NBA. And these parents see that, so they're they're on their kids and they're pushing them, and they they can they can see that money, they can see that bag. Got it, got it. Well, we want to thank you, Mr. Claxton, definitely being on the stoop today. We got one. Well, actually, I got two more questions for you, real quick. But that makes a lot of sense, man. He's Kids ain't learning the fundamentals and they're not working hard like yeah. they once did. So uh, we appreciate your insight on that. They all they all want to be they all want to be working on their James Harden step backs and all type of stuff, man. Everybody won't put up 40 footers now. Yeah. Be like Steph Curry. Absolutely. Absolutely. The last 24 months, uh, Mr. Claxton has been really, really crazy. Ever since 2016, we've seen athletes, sports organizations, and teams take a different stance. Um when everybody seen what Colin Kaepernick was doing as he was a quarterback then. But now let's uh, fast forward now to today, man. And we've seen some things happen in the last two weeks that we never would have thought in American history. Um, last season, the NBA finished off the league's uh, season in the bubble. What was your thoughts on the bubble? And as a part of this great NBA fraternity, do you think the NBA got it right? The messaging was right? Should they have not played in the bubble? And do you think they can move the things forward and continue to pressure people and helping support Black Lives Matter and racial injustice? The NBA is dope, man. They always get it right. Um, I think the, the the bubble was a great idea. I think it gave the world something to do with being in the house and it put their, their athletes on a bigger stage. And the athletes at the time were able to, to talk about the social injustices that was going on, you know, these athletes have a, a, a huge name and vocal opportunity. So they use, they gotta use their platform. And mm -hmm. I think a lot of them are. Um, I think what Kyrie Irving is doing is tremendous. I mean, he, he's donating money, he's donating food. He's, he, he, he bought George Floyd's family a house. Like he, he's just an, an incredible human be being for doing stuff that he's doing. Speaking okay. of Kyrie Irving, before we even get into anything else, uh, him in the Nets, we all know that they now have himself, Kevin Durant, and James Harden on the squad. Who you have them placing in the East this year? Oh, they they won. They they ain't, they ain't nobody being them. They going to the finals. Think they, I, I, think I, they I taking just, out Braun and AD? I didn't say that, but <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they're going to the finals. I think... They have to acquire a big if they want to seriously compete great. with the Lakers. I think if they go to trade Kyrie, or he's a great player, but I don't think there's a huge need for him. And if they they could get a, a big, say like a Andre Drummond, that could that's a rim protector, um, mm -hmm. who could go to the rim on uh, pick and rolls and catch lobs. Um, my think, man, D my man, DJ not good enough. Nah, yeah, DJ, nah. They, they need a younger DJ. Honestly, if he, if and they if also he, need if more. LA, if it was the LA clip with DJ, then absolutely. But Ooh. he's he's a little past his prime. I don't see him being able to guard uh, Anthony Davis out on the perimeter. Like they need to have an answer for Anthony Davis if they're gonna really contend with the Lakers. They also need a backup for DJ. I mean, he can't, he can't play all forty-eight. Well, I think and DJ if, should be the backup. Up, if, they get, if they could get Andre Drummond, DJ will be a hell of a backup. There you go. Ooh. After they gave up uh, Jared Allen, they were they were hurt. That's what I'm saying. If they if they, yeah. if they would if they if they would have been able to keep Jared Allen, then absolutely they would have been able to beat the Lakers. But whenever you got to to get something, you got to give up something. We all know that. Absolutely. Got to take. So, Mr. Class, we're going to finish this up since we're talking about, you know, great players and great legacies. You yourself was a guard and played in the league and 
as, a, as an NBA vet. But now we're going to put you on the sideline like you're doing right now as the coach. I wanted you to put a roster. You got 10 slots to pick the best uh, 10 guards in league history all time. You got 10 spots. <laughs> <laughs> you well, first, I'm going to go with my guy, CP3. Okay. Love him to death. I think I, even though he 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 gets the notoriety, but I still think he's he's very underrated. I think CP is an I think CP is an outstanding point guard, outstanding. Uh, so I would go with him. I would go with Steph, Dame Lillard, Isaiah Thomas, uh, Nate Tiny Archibald. Mm. Uh, let me let me see. My guy Tim Hardaway, which is why I wear watch out, which is why I wore number ten. You tap two step. Uh, I will, I will put Westbrook in there. Westbrook is a problem. Um, put That's Magic Johnson. In, put Magic in there. Okay, Magic. And how many more I got? You got two, two more. I'll put Kyrie in there. Okay. I'll put Kyrie in there. Did I, say, did I say Dame Lillard? You said Dame. You did take. I, I did say I said Dame. Let me see. Who can I be missing then? Let me see. Not a former Throw an old head in. Throw an old head in. No, no, huh? not, a, not a former That's, teammate of yours. Yeah, I was gonna say I'm looking, I'm looking for old. Head. Oh man, how can I forget my man Bubba Chuck? Yeah, how you ain't put Chuck in there? All right. Yeah, I can't forget my man Bubba Chuck. Yeah, it is solid, solid. <clears throat> well, hey, Mr. Class, we definitely want to thank you, man, and we wish you all the best going in the next season. Hopefully, y'all get a season going on where fans can enjoy y'all and you rocking and rolling. But we wish you all the best in all the future endeavors that you got going on. Thanks, man. Appreciate y'all. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> For my guy, Kev P, it's been another great episode of The Stoop. Make sure y'all subscribe, like all these good episodes we got coming. Y'all stay tuned for more. Take care.